Uh, thank you. Well, it's my pleasure to speak here and to present for some general overview of Russia's policy, foreign policy, of course. Uh, if you don't mind, I won't read the text which was prepared for me. Maybe I won't sound that smooth <laughs> if reading, but I don't want to look like Hollywood portrait from Soviet dipl diplomats of this uh, like wooden muppets. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I should to state that Russia has a bad luck to be global power. <laughs> global power, of course, sounds very nice and very prestigious, but it's awkwardly heavy burden to be to bear responsibility for everything and in the world or be held responsible for everything what's happening in the world and sometimes to be blamed for everything bad was going in the in the world and of course most of common people have very uh, simplified perception of the international life also cultivated by Hollywood which makes an illusion that all international problems are, can be easily resolved uh, with help of uh, U.S. soldiers, sergeants, generals, and so on. One good shot, one good punch with a fist, and everything's okay. <laughs> Regrettably, Hollywood is not is holy, and somewhere beyond the clouds, and not, has not its foot on the bottom. International life is very diverse, multidimensional, and very sophisticated. Well, the world now is undergoing uh, real global changes. The great Ch Chinese philosopher Confucius said, for God's sake, don't live in time of changes. Regrettably, it's not our case. The essence of what we see in the world is that the global architecture which was formed after the Second World War is now becoming more shaky, more fragile. What I mean, actually, you know, that Second World War was a tremendous shock to the whole population. The horror of the world made the whole uh, the world leaders think that they have to develop kind of arrangement which would help to prevent a new world war that's how uh, the incumbent system which pyramid shaped with un security council on the top and spreading down with un special entity special institutions and other local arrangements well <clears throat> that was constructed by the way uh, does anybody know the place where UN was born no one well actually it's well known exact city exact country exact city exact building exact room and even the corner of this room I should say it's today's guest house of Russia's foreign ministry in the very center of Moscow where <coughs> ministers of foreign affairs <coughs> of Soviet Union, US and Great Britain came together where they were sitting in a certain corner well, and developed the idea of creating United Nations. Mm -hmm. Well now it is undergoing transformation. Uh, we call what's going on regionalization. That, I, that means that the, the decision making, the policy making power now moves from the UN and UN system to regional uh, institutions and arrangements. And they become, are becoming the core of the world policy. Is it good or bad? It's too early to say it. Though it's a bit worrisome because 
uh, <coughs> usually it's uh, been characteristic for the period preceding a war. Let's hope, let's, but let's be hopeful. In any case, uh, we have to think how to live under new conditions. Well, we still believe that UN should maintain its role as a key instrument of peace and stability and cooperation. But it should, mean the new, should meet the new realities. Uh, this system was working on the basis, as if we call it as it is, of confrontation between two systems, two camps, one capitalist, one socialist. And two great powers leading these camps, mainly, I mean, US and the Soviet Union, they needed a venue uh, to discuss their, pro to address their problems and to try to find, find common understanding and then forward this understanding to their allies. That, in reality, was the real purpose of uh, the real role of UN. Now we don't see such clear uh, cent uh, two centers. Of course, there are some hints to uh, possibility of new bipolarity, but I don't think that would be the major trend. We see now that the world is becoming clearly multipolar. Well, US, China, Russia, India, well, South Africa, Brazil, all uh, well, new countries in the Asia Pacific, all of them are playing a significant role in the international life. And uh, this reality should be addressed. And UN, of course, should be reformed. But we, we should be very cautious with it. And you know that uh, the quest for a uh, new shape of UN is proceeding already for decades. And still, no solution which might be acceptable for everyone, everyone was found. found. That's what it, that it means, how difficult it, everything is. Uh, <clears throat> what's the Russia's place here? Uh, please allow me to look a little bit, but deep into the history. Well, actually, not many people think that Russia's history is much more ancient than uh, it's usually believed. Uh, because Russia accepted Julian calendar, which was the calendar of Orthodox Eastern Christian Church, only in the year of 1700 by the decree of Peter the I. By the, by the time he issued his decree, according to Russian traditional calendar, calendar, it was the year 7,000. 208. Just with only a move of his finger, Peter I abandoned five and a five, five and a half thousand years of Russian history. <laughs> but we're today not to talk about history and history puzzles, but about real policy. But it's Russia usually is believed, especially portrayed, that in the West, like a kind of European outback, like uh, a country which is doomed to be secondary, to be subordinate, a country which uh, doesn't have any uh, real own active foreign policy. Well, it's not true. Well, Russia had, before actually emerging as a state, had very active policy start, which documentary founded and proved starting uh, 11th century, then 13th century, and in the 15th century, Russia's Tsar, the first Tsar of Russia, Ivan the Fourth, which decades long and fairly was called the terrible, decades after his death. Well, he was so influential, actually, that when a Sweden, uh, the king of Sweden sent him a letter addressing him uh, like an equal, uh, the Ivan IV, uh, he was a tough guy and loved strong wording, like Don Trump, <laughs> uh, responded with a letter addressing the, his Sweden colleague as a you stinchy dog, how do you dare address me like a meek me, a heir of the Roman emperors. <laughs> yes. 
It's history. Well, and the first pan-European process embodied in the Vienna Congress from 1814 to 1815 was initiated by Russian Emperor Alexander I. By the way, by that time, the most popular and influential state leader in the whole EU of Europe who defeated Napoleon. And uh, do you know that the famous composition Ludwig van Beethoven für Elise, or in English for Elise, Eliza, was devoted to wife of Emperor Alexander I. So Russia for, was from the, and uh, during the uh, time of Nicholas I, the Russian Emperor, his chancellor once said that not a single cannon in Europe would fire without our permission. That was a real place of Russia, historically, in the word policy. And it's still the same. Of course, nowadays, Russia is often accused of being aggressive, being imperial, and so on. It's neither one is true. Russia is a great power, and we pursue a policy of great power, but of great not of special rights, but of special responsibility of great a great power, a special responsibility for international peace is a, a, a stability. Uh, and our foreign policy is often very open. And you know our contribution to the strengthening of world strategic stability to the to promoting arm controlled regime. Well, everybody should know that Russia was one of the, and Soviet Union actually was one of the architects of NPT Treaty and one of the depositarian states. Russia was, and Soviet Union and Russia, you see, it's not a hair to the Soviet Union, that's the, we are a country that continues the existence. Though we are, have basically another different political system, we have diff, basically different foreign policy, but still we continue this the existence of our previous cradle, of our cradle, that we are architects of the uh, <coughs> test ban treaty. It's not our fault that U.S. still haven't, have no, has not uh, ratified this treaty. We are architects of a number of other international regimes promoted, which are promoting international peace and stability. And let me uh, quote the Winston Churchill, who once said, the concept uh, of faith is live according your conscience, is the Russian way. It was said by Winston Churchill, who was never sympathetic to Russia, to Soviet Union, and actually who was the architect of all the Cold War but still here, recognized. <clears throat> Let's switch to Asian Pacific. Well, Russia, you know, is Eurasian state. We kind of bridge, and of course, of, course, of enormous size. <clears throat> well, nothing personal, but Russia is uh, to Australia, up to its territory. <laughs> exactly. Australia is about 8 million kilom square kilometers. Russia is 16 plus. Square square kilometers. <coughs> the, oh, but of course, our the most of Russian population, the most of Russian uh, <coughs> well industry is all are concentrated in the well, European part. It was historically de <coughs> uh, determined, but what it, we have, what we have, and a uh, lot of times. Both Soviet and then Russian governments have declared, adopted programs of uh, social economic growth of Russian Eastern Siberia and Far East. Of course, they are, speaking frankly, it's not a secret, they are underpopulated. The whole population of the Russia's Far East is about 8 million people only. Uh, of course, very weak, weak infrastructure, but we still have strong industrial and uh, scientific, technical scientific basis. By the way, 
uh, it was heritage of the Second World War, where, when a lot, a lot of big uh, industri industri industrial enterprises were evacuated from the European part of Soviet Union to Siberia and to the, to the Far East, and they've created this basis. Well, I'm not talking about enormous resources or natural resources of the Russia, Siberia, and Far, and far East. That, and we have to exploit it, everything, to explore it, to pro provide economic growth. That determines, first of all, foremost, our fatal and interest in cooperation with uh, Asian and uh, Asian Pacific country, countries, in deep engagement in uh, the life, regional life, in pro promoting peace and stability in Asia and Pacific. You know, Asia Pacific is a specific region, and you, being your country, being located completely for 100 percent year, well, you know it better. Well, it's uh, the life and relations in Asia Pacific are uh, built based mostly on Asian mentality, Asian tradition, Asian standards and criteria, and they are clearly different from those uh, well in. Europe and Atlantic. <clears throat> what, it, what it means? What is specific? Uh, like that time, um, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense of the U.S., then Assistant Secretary of State of the U.S., uh, Curry Campbell said, we I mean, Americans are nations of substance. We want quick and feasible solution of all problems. We present an idea, and then it should be implemented. We implement it. That's absolutely the opposite what the Asians are used to do. They don't like any movement from upside down. They prefer a natural evolution from down upside. They don't want to do any, don't like to do anything in a hurry. They prefer slow, gradual movements, low discussion. It's very clear. Just see uh, <clears throat> uh, this is ASEAN Regional Forum for Security, ARF. They are talking about preventive diplomacy already for decades long and still uh, well, reached the second world in the 200 words long sentence. Uh, well, it's so. You, you won't find any real structurized full-scale multilateral organizations in Asia and Pacific. Mostly, only for us. There is only one real organization, well, STO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, but the attention, the focus of STO agenda is concentrated mostly in Central Asia and around Central Asia, but the, 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 is not going to the East. All others, well, APEC is the four. East Asia Summit, it's a forum. ASEAN, do uh, most looking more like organization, but its legal infrastructure is far beyond, behind those uh, which uh, SCO possess and all others. And we should take in consideration this idea. In Gorbachev times, once we well, disregarded, it, ignored the specific, and Gorbachev, he loved this huge, uh, large-scale idea, presented idea of Asian security, like something like OSCE. Oh, and then we spent at least half a year explaining here, even to our best friends, that we didn't mean anything bad. Just be quiet. <laughs> Everything's okay, we don't know to impose anything on you, and so on. That, that was the result. Well, like in the world, in the whole world, in Asian Pacific thing, there are two different approaches to multilateral cooperation, to multilateral security, to promoting security. One is, ba is based on, I should call it hardware. I mean the military alliances. Well, we can't deny the role. Actually, though, you know, our principal basic position 
uh, Russia is against military alliances. We believe that their existence and uh, that attempts to make their existence for eternally long is counterproductive. But at the same time, one should understand that actually military alliance doesn't existence of military alliance doesn't violate any international norm, any international law. The problem is that military alliance should act within the international law, not exceed it, not assume illegal uh, <clears throat> priorities and powers. That's, <clears throat> that's the key issue, the framework for activity of a military alliance. And if a military alliance acts within the framework, within the limits of international law, well, they can simply be, well, uh, used also become a part of other uh, more advanced and uh, well multilateral security arrangements. And one, any, in any case, we can't deny the possibilities of American-based alliances to provide <coughs> transportation services, to provide humanitarian aid, to provide all this needed assistance when some technogenic or natural disasters happen. If somebody has something better, then you're welcome, but I don't think, I don't see anyone. But still, we insist on the security based on software. I mean political arrangements. That's why we've learned lessons from our previous mistakes. And we've presented that idea of new uh, archi architecture of regional security. It was presented in 2010 as a joint Russian-Chinese Russian initiative. A year later, it was joined by Brunei. It, does, it doesn't contain any well, <clears throat> comprehensive scheme, detailed mechanisms, and so, and so on. No, it's a list of short but basic principles of, of, of peace and coexistence of the different states in Asia and Pacific. Uh, it's kind of code of conduct which is to be worked out. And we are working on it. By the way, we are making progress, and it's been addressed under the within the framework of East Asian Summit. And more and more uh, countries are getting interested in discussing uh, this idea. Well, we understand Australia is a, a close ally of the U.S. You are you have military alliance with the U.S. Actually. And due to this alliance, <coughs> you might afford the luxury of having very small limited armed forces, not to spend enormous money for arms and military programs. Well, we understand everything, and we don't think it's an <coughs> obstacle for our cooperation. But I'll address it just a bit later. <coughs> so, what we have in Asia Pacific? Of course, our economic engagement is very small <coughs> as up to now. Well, we have, of course, our major trade partner is China, over $100 billion of annual amount. Second is uh, about, I guess, it's South Korea, about $26 billion. Japan, well, it's now at $17 billion a year, but it dropped one quarter, 25%, in compared to the 2015. Uh, of course, it's tiny. It's tiny. Well, with Australia, we could hardly make $700 million last year. Well, one could laugh if, if it was not that sad. <laughs> uh, but still, we have a lot of achievements and uh, the sphere of uh, policy and security. First of all, well, we made a huge progress in our relations with ASEAN uh, last year. We had in May in Sochi a Russia ASEAN summit, which took a decision to upgrade our relations, Russia ASEAN relations, to the state of the full scale strategic partnership. It's a basically new stage of our relations. Secondly, I would say, would list uh, the fact that India and Pakistan signed the memorandums 
with uh, Shafa Cooperation Organization concerning their obligations uh, due to their uh, forthcoming full membership in SCO. Imagine, after India and Pakistan would join and completely SCO, the organization would embrace 40% of the population of the world and produce 25% of the world GDP. I'm, I'm talking about only member states. I'm not talking about observers and part, dialogue partners of SCO. So the authority and influence of this and political weight of STO is growing. I'm very glad to see it because, well, <clears throat> uh, with all my own modesty, I would say that I was among the architects of this organization. <laughs> and actually, I worked out new, personally, worked out nearly the whole infra, legal infrastructure of STO. That was, that's why I was that proud about it. <laughs> you can understand. <clears throat> well, Eastern Economic Forum, you see, <clears throat> it was launched only two or three years ago, uh, but it's gaining momentum rapidly. Last year it was a big success. More than 3,500 3, participants from 56 countries. Over 200 contracts signed. The overall value one trillion or uh, 850 billion rubles. Well, about 300 billion dollars. Not bad for one week event, I should say. <clears throat> well, uh, I've mentioned already our multilateral approaches, perception of multilateral arrangement for. Asia-Pacific stability. Our another idea is to promote an idea of comprehensive partnership with participation of Euro-Asian Economic uh, uh, Union, SCO, and ASEAN. And well, uh, the very detailed discussion is going on. And actually, you know that there were already six rounds of uh, multilateral talks on this issue as a, up to now. So we see a lot of common in our uh, in our policy in Asia Pacific with Australia, where yes, well, as I've mentioned, you're an uh, ally of US. We are negative towards ally uh, <coughs> military alliances, but at the same time we are realist. We want, we are realistic and. We see a very broad field of fruitful and mutually beneficial cooperation between Russia and Australia in global issues. Well, arms control. You know that there are now quite difficult situations around the nuclear disarmament. A group of so-called <coughs> extreme anti-nuclear states emerged, which insist to make right now a, an agreement which completely bans nuclear weapons now. Well, sounds good, but absolutely unrealistic, because it's possible only under certain security, in certain security environment. And we're very glad to see that Australia doesn't support such extreme approach. And you're about the realistic moderate state. We can cooperate in it. Well, we have a lot of common, by the way, when we look at the agenda for the UN, and we often support each other and the candidates of each other to the different posts in the, within the framework of U.S. Well, Northeast Asia. Of course, Northeast Asia, when we say Northeast Asia, first of all, we say North Korea. Yeah. We also have a lot of in common. And <clears throat> maybe during Q&A, I would elaborate more on this on this issue on this issue we also interested in peaceful solution I would mention and by the way Australia showed a great interest already in being engaged in uh, issues of Northeast Asia already for a number of years I recall and actually after 
the, uh, I should say, well, pause after, no, I wouldn't say the abortion, demolition of six party talk. I'm still a historic optimist. <coughs> but it was Australia who uh, proposed to uh, substitute uh, Japan in rude oil supplies. Not rude oil, but uh, heavy fuel oil supplies to North Korea. I recall it. And as a, uh, when I was a special ambassador to better at large, I was often several times invited to Australia for talks. I was said I would be eager to come, but to, under one condition that the time in, in Australia would be at least not shorter than time, time on the plane. <laughs> You see, so we have a lot, a lot of things to do within the framework, East a framework of East Asia Summit, and you are interested, by the way, in cybersecurity, and that's your main, one of the main focuses. Well, you know, cybersecurity is also a Russia's priority. We can work together. So, uh, in the economic field, uh, well. A very broad field. Recently, in Perth, there was a big international conference on energy uh, hosted by APPEA and a big delegation from Russian, one of the biggest uh, gas and oil producing companies, Novatech, attended it. Regrettably, I couldn't go there because I had to, the, to attend these three poor uh, heads of mission, annual heads of mission trips hosted by Julia Bishop. It was the same, same day and my DHM or DCM is still to arrive and couldn't dispatch anyone else. So, <clears throat> once again, we have very uh, broad field of cooperation. Of course, uh, our bilateral relations are still at quite a low profile, but I am hopeful that they've passed the lowest point and now slowly but gradually moving in a positive, positive direction, and I hope that this direction would be steady. Well, thank you, and now I'm ready to take your answer. Questions? Thank you very much. While people are formulating their questions, I might uh, get the first one in. And, uh, based on your experience, long experience in China, uh, so how do you how do you see China's leadership aspirations in the region, and particularly in view of the Belt and Road Initiative, which has, uh, has been the subject of a recent uh, conference in China? You mentioned several uh, of the uh, associations that uh, Russia is involved with in the region, the SCO and the Eurasian Economic Union. How how do all these things interact with the Belt and Road Initiative? Well, <clears throat> I can't tell you in details, but uh, I know that both foreign ministries and other relevant agencies of Russia and China are working on it, how to coordinate this Euro-Asian Euro Economic Union and this One Belt, One Road initiative. It's, we've discussed it with the Chinese already for a few years. And uh, it, it gives, it produces results, practical results, and I can you, I can't give you more, de more, de more details. What about China? China is a great country. Oh, well, China was ruling Eastern Hemisphere for decades, for centuries, if not millenniums long. Yes, there was a very heavy decline uh, of China in the starting the first half of the 19th century and up to the very end of 19th and the beginning of 20th century when China too was turned into half colony. But now China is regaining its position and we should accept it as it is. And we, my experience of dealing with China shows that Chinese always tend to find a compromise. 
they always prefer a compromise to, for, to, prefer, to get a, an agreement. That's why we simply should not try to contain China, to stop China, especially stop Chinese development. We have to find a common grammar, common language with Chinese. And if you are eager to find a common language, you would all, always find it. Oh, thank you very much. Now we open to questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Here are time, first one. Thank you. Ambassador Grigori is one of the very long-standing members of this institute, mm -hmm. previous office bearer. I, I wish you a very warm welcome here tonight. And the, thank you. the size of the crowd shows the uh, appreciation in which your, your, your talk and your personality is held. Well, now, deserve. <laughs> <laughs> now um, I, I want to follow up on his question with a question about the, the One Belt, One Road initiative mm -hmm. meeting in Beijing. As you know, Australia did not attend that meeting. Uh, Why? Uh, you actually, Australia, no, the Prime Minister didn't attend, but Stephen Silva was there. That's, that's correct. Stephen Silva was there. Yes, yeah, that is correct. Oh, well, that's been corrected. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. good. But there was a statement made, I think, by an Australian representative that we had to consider it in terms of our Australian national security interest. If, if you were speaking to Stephen Chauvin now, if you were here in this audience, how would you say that for Australia to get behind this initiative, One Belt, One Road, and also SCO, would not in any way threaten Australian security interest? Well, you see, One Belt, One Road, it's not a military arrangement. It's, it's economic. It's trade and financial investment. That's why, uh, not to, how can it threaten international security? I'm used well to uh, strongly define threat is one thing. Threat is military threat. Threat is terroristic attack or some technogenic or uh, a natural catastrophe. It is well. It might be threat for Yellowstone super mega volcano. It, it's a, it, it will, would be going to erupt. It's a threat. All others things are challenges. You know. Well, in the 90s, I was one of the uh, within the working working group working on Russia's national strategy con, uh, concept, and we've draw a very uh, strong, clear line between threats and challenges. What you say, I prefer call challenge, but it's your challenge for how you would conduct your domestic, first of all, financial economic policy. That means how strong Australia would be and how smartly you would handle the negotiations with the Chinese if you are going to engage. As up to now, well, we never give uh, any advices to other countries. That's our major difference from the Americans. <laughs> uh, but uh, I see that Australia is still uh, trying to make a choice between one belt, one road, or TTP. Yes, TTP with the US or without US. But I guess the TPP with China instead of US won't be TTP and won't be one belt, one road. Yeah, that's why it's your choice. That's it. Once again, it's a challenge, but it's not a threat. Right, I've got a question here. Um, you said Russia's against um, military alliances. So what would, you, what would your approach be uh, as a, as a substitute for a um, balance of power in the Asia Pacific region if we do not go uh, ahead and do uh, military alliances? Well, that's the problem. And we would have to respond. And you know that we are already responding, though accused of being aggressive. Yeah, it's very funny when NATO is moving its military machine to or closer to Russia's border, it's okay. It's only defense. Who's against who? when Russia is doing something like we, we don't have military installation or, uh, in other countries. Well, but we, when we are strengthening our stability, it's aggression. Mm. You see, it's double, uh, double standards issue, the issue of double standard policy. And that's why, I, and by the way, I, North Korea, yeah, 
Uh, we still believe that the U.S. are located placing these THAD subs, uh, these anti-missile systems in rock. We still believe it's same not, uh, actually our military specialists can show it on a clear, with clear data in their hands, that it's not against North Korea. They want these uh, installed systems won't intercept North Korean missiles. Yeah, that's against, first of all, China, and uh, they end, and against Russia. What should we do? Yes, thank you. Well, well there is one uh, aircraft carrier now, Carl Winston, in uh, the Sea of Japan, or as Karim say, the Eastern Sea, uh, uh, the Korean Sea. Yeah, uh, I don't think, I think it's just, not occasionally that it's the Sea of Japan, because in the Yellow Sea, it would cause a very strong reaction from Beijing. Because if in the Yellow Sea, their uh, <coughs> fighters, the planes from the aircraft carrier, would reach Beijing in three minutes, do you see that the uh, Chinese would feel safe? Of course, of course not. And they would have to take some. That's why, once again, it shows that to base your policy only on military would cause only military response, would cause only further growth of instability, insecurity, regrettably. Mm -hmm. And what we are trying to explain to the North Koreans, and they don't listen. <laughs> your Excellency, I'm Robert Johnson, a member of the local branch. Um, I congratulate you on a very interesting presentation. Thank you. I was particularly interested in the first five minutes when you spoke about after World War II and the breakdown of mm -hmm. the United Nations and it's the... It's not breakdown, but it well, became the shaking. Fra the fracturing. Yes. And what I want to put to you is a scenario which I've been thinking about, which is based on exactly what you talked about I put it to you that World War Three has already started and it's not like World War Two or previous wars. They were state versus state. Mm -hmm. Now World War Three is civil wars within states. I read an article recently, there are today 22 wars within the boundaries of states going on in the world today. So I put it to you, sir, that World War Three has already started. How do you feel about that? Well, I wouldn't be that pessimistic, though uh, such proposition is not unre unreasonable. And actually, it's been believed that the generals are always prepared for the previous war. <laughs> and within the next, next war, they are starting learning. And Russia or Russians are becoming best fighters about on the third year of every war. Uh, but <clears throat> no, it's uh, it's unhappy joke. But it uh, has reasons, and very serious reasons, because what we see, we see very little possibility of, as you said, war before states. Because uh, people understand what it would mean, the use of weapons of mass, mass destruction it would be a mutual annihilation. In reality, actually, one should not go on war and launch missiles, nuclear missiles against others. Just commit nuclear suicide, it would be enough to annihilate uh, life on Earth, on Earth. In any case, it would be annihilated either. That's what. That's all. What we see is uh, so-called new threats, which are assuming already a global scope. And we are talking about terrorism. Speaking frankly, at early stages, I thought that terrorism, uh, the threat of terrorism, international terrorism, is a bit exaggerated for some certain political purpose. But now I see that I was wrong. And <clears throat> what's happening in Syria and Iraq? You see, the first attempt of the Islamic terrorists 
to create their own state, <coughs> to assume a statehood and confront the whole other civilization. Maybe it's a clash of civilization, maybe, but it's clear that the conflict might be well generated there. And from this point of view, well, who knows, who knows? Maybe uh, the Third World War. I don't think that uh, still our differences and disagreements on in these spheres would cause a full-scale military conflict. What can be, what can occur, and well, once again, getting to my darling North Korea. Uh, <laughs> you see, yes, one aircraft carrier is already there, the second is heading there, strategic bombers <coughs> are there, also B-52s, B-2s, and others. Uh, F-22's Raptors are also stationed there, and so on. At what time <coughs> the North Korea might lose its passion? And also a personal issue. What if North Korea would do something? And from this point of view, we are moving from bad option <coughs> to very bad, and from very bad to even worse option. And maybe at some point we would understand that to have North Korea now as it is, despite it com conflict, completely uncomfortable, it was better than my, what happened next. Yeah. Okay, Dominic and then David, thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for a very interesting talk. Um, Russia has been criticized for its close alliance with the Syrian regime. Uh, it's widely accepted that Syria has committed um, some very serious crimes against humanity and against international law in general. Um, and I just wonder to what extent is Russia trying to persuade the, the Syrian leadership to accept international legal and humanitarian standard, standards in dealing with the opposition? Well, you see, I basically disagree. Well, first of all, you might like Syrian regime, might dislike. Before everything started, excuse me, but was Syrian regime more despotic than and less democratic than in Saudi Arabia, for example? Yeah, what's the fault? What the guilt of Syrian regime that is being now that way widely slammed and even sometimes bombed? And wear clothes. What kind of crimes? You mean the chemicals, the so-called chemical attack? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excuse me, but I can talk a lot about it. And I've, but I've talked about it on the, <clears throat> on the TV, on ABC, because all evidences, which as if proof that it was attacked by the Bashar Assad governmental forces, are fake, completely. And their medical science shows that these, pe these uh, poor children, which were whole, uh, well shown to the whole world, were not under ga influence of gas. They were under influence of psychotropic uh, well, stuff, medicine. And actually, but it's not our con conclusion. It's the conclusion of Sweden, Swedish uh, doctors, by the way. <coughs> Uh, well, what was dropped? It's not an air bomb. It was, what do we believe? What happened? Either it, the uh, Assad's planes bombed a factory where this poisonous gas was produced by the ISIS. Yes, and uh, uh, the story stockpiles of this gas were bigger than expected, and they caused this cloud, poisonous cloud. Either it, these bombs and it was landmines, not air, airborne bombs, were launched, uh, exploded by these ISIS deliberately. Oh, you see, all investigation, it looks like, uh, just uh, imagine a cri criminal detective well, investigating a murder only based on the photos of the killed pe person and crying, ah, well, poor guys, that's all. 
But that's the investigation was carried out. We, and actually, I said, what the vote, what actually right was given to anyone to interfere to bomb sovereign state? Actually, who was, why don't we recall uh, the 90s, 1998, when Serbia was bombed for 78 consecutive days? How many thousands of innocent civilians were killed at that time? Uh, NATO spokesman Jamie Shea, shyly and cynically, I, I'll say, as it is called it, collateral damage. Yes, as a pieces of wood, not human lives. Collateral damage, collateral damage. How many people, what the cost of NATO involvement into, <coughs> in Iraq and Libya and so on? That's why. Let's, think, let's, don't have, if they, let's not uphold double standards. And actually, I, yeah, today I have already used an expression uh, by former U.S. Congress well, Speaker of uh, House, Sam Rayburn, <coughs> that a jackass can kick down the barn, but it needs a carpenter who can restore the barn. Yes, and let's look from this point of view, who is a jackass and who is a carpenter? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Ambassador, thank you very much. Yes. For one, of, one of the interesting things in your packed uh, CV was your interest in North Korea. Can I take you back to your dial yeah. North Korea? Um, and ask you, what was your interpreter? I mean, you must stay up with the diplomatic traffic on North yes. Korea. Um, what was your interpretation of the meeting between President Trump and President Xi Jinping in regard to North Korea? Do you think there was an agreement on a particular way forward in that regard? And secondly, you mentioned that we've gone from bad to worse in terms of options. What do you think is the way forward? Well, <clears throat> if you don't mind, I want uh, to talk on personalities. President Trump is president of the United States. He, ha he has his special, okay, he's specific, well, but he is a president of a great country and we respect him and a choice of American people. Well, of course, it's worrisome that he was the first to openly articulate <laughs> the possibility of military option. It's serious, of course. But at the same time, we believe that being a big businessman, he is very realistic and very pragmatic. What about North Korea? It's a very difficult partner to deal with. And uh, we've presented, we've developed and presented enormous amount of different options <coughs> for North Korea uh, under one premise that they would abandon their nuclear weapons and missile programs. But they don't want to listen. But <coughs> just imagine, what's next? If uh, only military option. Well, North Korea, unlike South Korea, for 60 consecutive years, the whole actual period after the Korean War was preparing for a new war. And you won't be, you would, you have only a choice. Either you have to annihilate whole North Korea, or there would be fatal damage to South Korea. I don't know why I'm not going to speak for American colleagues, whether they're going to sacrifice to fight with North Korea up to the very last South Korean soldier. But <clears throat> that's the real situation. The toll of alleged hypothetical military option would be enormous. First of all, for South Korea. Yes, <clears throat> that's, what, that's what I mean, that we are moving from, very, from bad to very bad, from very bad to even wor worse. <clears throat> well, our view is that uh, North Korean issue, the military, uh, this nuclear and missile issue can be resolved only in the broad context of the whole de uh, general detente in Northeast Asia. Yes, and we have to move along. Yes, downsizing the military activity military posture in the region and downsizing 
uh, North Korean nuclear and missile activity. Uh, and we are hopeful that at certain stage the North Korean leadership would listen to us and will understand that there is uh, only one option. Yes, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, my next question is not as uh, complex and as uh, realist in tone. <coughs> I'm interested in Russia and the whole idea of soft power. Mm -hmm. I have been very impressed with seeing um, Russia today reach uh, our television screens. Um, I'm interested to hear your comments about foreign policy and the expansion of Russian soft power to the likes of Russia today. Well, it's absolute natural. We maybe uh, for some period we suffered an inertia from Soviet times when Soviet Union was a closed, very closed country. And due to it, we've suffered and uh, very heavy losses. For example, just recall this tragic accident when a North Korean, a South Korean a plane 007 was shut down over the Sea of Okhotsk. If Soviet Union was not that closed, what not that I should say that is it's that clumsy in its information, soft power, the situation would be absolutely another. Now we are regaining momentum. You know, well, we've got a spokeswoman uh, in our foreign ministry. Actually, I know her from that because she is a daughter of my old colleague and friend, also a sinologist, and she speaks Chinese also. Uh, well, it's new, new style. You see, new style. Our uh, world media is working in another shape. That's what we believe that it's absolutely natural. Well, we actually, we up to activity, well, we are still far beyond, uh, well, up to scope, we are still far beyond the U.S. <laughs> the Americans, once again, well, once again, I'm addressing Americans as my opponents. Uh, though I highly dislike it. Uh, well, you see, they have to still to get used to the fact that Russia is regaining its status as a great independent power with its own independent policy based on its own independent interests. That's all. <laughs> We've got time for one. Last question. Well, we'll two leaders. One, one hand <laughs> to the air, sir, please. Go ahead. To follow up on the soft power, um, I would like to ask about declaration between Russia um, and China on promotion of international law mm -hmm. from 2006. So what I wanted to ask exactly is um, probably underlining part of this uh, declaration is criticism of international law being not attuned to non-Western countries. So, is there any follow-up after this declaration? Was there anything? Um, well, speaking, for, I'm sorry, but I'm not aware. In okay. this detail. Yes, regretfully. Thank you. Maybe we won't count it as a loss. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, One last hand over there. Yeah. Thank yes. you. I just want to thank Ambassador. Uh, I want to refer to North Korea issue. Uh, you said that military is not the military solution is not acceptable, but um, what can be proposed North Korea after the violation of Budapest Memorandum? First of all, uh, who will violate Budapest Memorandum, by the way? Yes, Russia. Russia? How? Yes, the, you attack Ukraine. We attack Ukraine? Yes. Ukraine? Have you seen a single Russian soldier there? Yes, it was <laughs> it, Yeah, because, well, uh, today I was watching some a talk show on TV, and some uh, young guy also said, well, you you are invading Ukraine. Uh, he was asked, have you listed, show us at least one Russian soldier in Ukraine? He said, but you are under sanctions. That's the proof. <laughs> Actually, you see, <clears throat> when one of the parties to the Budapest Memorandum well, interferes in the Ukrainian domestic affairs, orchestrates a coup, illegal, removes a le illegally uh, elected president is, and establishes illegal government, is it a violation of Budapest Memorandum or not? By the way, you have you read the Budapest Memorandum? At least seen it? Yes. And could you see at least the provision we have violated? Ambassador, I, want, I don't want 
But you are accusing us of uh, intervening. So you say you, you are uh, stating that uh, the last memorandum was not violated. It, it can be a kind of solution for North Korea. Yes. Okay. Yes. It was my idea. By the way, I can say it openly. <laughs> that about three years ago or four, I developed this idea of uh, signing a memorandum of security guarantees to North Korea. But, by the way, I'm still afraid that you have only seen the Budapest Memorandum and never read it. If you read it properly, you won't see any chapter, any word we have violated. We've never uh, undertook, well, to interfere, to assume the illegal government in Ukraine. The Budapest Memorandum concerns only international security guarantees of Ukraine and nothing in common with the domestic situation. And when the U.S. openly said that we spent five billion dollars only to, to cultivate the opposition, is it not interference in, your, in domestic affairs? When the legally elected president was removed by a coup? No, he ran away from his country. He's away from the country, yes. Yes. All right. It's amazing. Well, I really admire well, such naive logic. Well, childish. Thank you. Well, I meant to say <laughs> some notes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think I'm going to draw a line under tonight's uh, presentation. Uh, and I'm sure you'll agree with me that uh, the ambassador has given us a very frank and lively uh, discussion of events uh, taking the broad sweep of history right up until today. So well, thank you for your thank you. presentation, Ambassador. My warm pleasure. welcome back to, or warm welcome to Canberra. We hope that you can come back to our meetings in the future. Thank you. Thank you.